You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. That which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God, the Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is working mightily in my life, being confirmed with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. Turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. I've been teaching on the subject of a new law for a new people. And that means that we who believe on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we literally have a lifestyle and a way of living that befits us because we are new creatures. We're new creation people. We're not what we used to be. Some people say, well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's not a correct statement. That's a misappropriation of the word new creature. You are not a sinner now that you are a new creature. Now that you are a new creature, you are a new self. You are a new species. You are a person that has been transformed and changed, made into something that you were not once before. You are now a new creation, a new creature. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, and that word man refers to anyone that's man or woman, boy or girl. If you are in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, what we're doing is taking the word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and we're allowing this word that God has given unto us to be a commandment to us. It's an opportunity for us to say, all right, Lord, since I'm in Christ Jesus, since I have received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I now have the responsibility to behold that I'm new and I'm to be aware that I'm no longer what I used to be because before I received Jesus, I was a sinner. I was without Christ. I was not born again. And since I wasn't born again, then I was we classify for this particular instruction of a new law for new people. I was a caterpillar. And as a caterpillar, I didn't have any way of of identifying with or I didn't have a way of understanding or even thinking about how to fly as a butterfly because a caterpillar is a caterpillar and it f crawls on the ground. It doesn't think about soaring in the air and migrating and going from different blossoms to other blossoms, drinking of nectar and so forth. It, a caterpillar it just crawls around looking for leaves to chew on. And my point being is when you were a sinner, you had a nature that was apart from the nature of God. You were described as a sinner as being in the flesh. You're described as one that has a heart 
without faith and therefore you could not please God. A non-believer in Christ Jesus is an old man, a fleshly man, one that is described as being in darkness, described as being a child of disobedience, a child of the devil. In other words, there were certain in, in a nature that a person has without Christ. There is a behavior that speaks of that they're in a body that is dictating their mind, which is darkened, and their heart, which is darkened. And so therefore, a sinner cannot please God. But when you're born again, and we're going to look at scripture that talks about now that you're born again, you're to behold the fact that you're no longer a caterpillar, you are a butterfly. And as a butterfly, you can fly now. As a butterfly, you think differently. As a butterfly, you don't eat what you used to eat when you were a caterpillar. Now you are a child of the living God. And God's word is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your pathway. God's word gives the entrance of light so that you can literally take flight and do what God has asked you to do in this life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, again, we're going to read it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And notice in verse 18, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Reconciled means that which was broken apart is now able to be joined together. So we who are in Christ, we are reconciled to God. God does not look at us as sinners. Even if a believer in Christ Jesus makes mistakes while they're learning how to enjoy the benefits of being a new creature. The believer in Christ Jesus is reconciled, joined together with God. And so all of you that are born again, all of you that have received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, say these words as you have your hand over your heart. Say, I'm reconciled to God. God is not angry with me. God is not impatient with me. God is long suffering with me. Because I'm a new creature. I'm his child learning how to behold all things that are new within me. In Jesus name. Amen. So be patient with yourself. I remember when I was in college at the university campus and I was had parked on the street in a big grass field at the time that I was walking from the classroom to my car and there was a, a man with his child, little boy, that was running. I guess he was about three or four maybe years old. And that little boy was running and running and running and the father allowed him to run in front of him. And uh, there was no danger of him getting, you know, caught up in the traffic or anything. It was a big field. And uh, sure enough, that little boy fell. And when the little boy fell, he tripped over himself because he was still learning how to get his, his coordination together. He fell and he was lying down on the ground and he was crying and, oh, I'm falling, I'm falling, oh, I'm falling. And his dad looks at him and his dad runs over to him and he gets on his knees and he picks up his son and he looks him over and he dusts him off and he hugs him and he says, you're okay, son, you're okay. And the little boy was really disappointed with himself for making the mistake of falling, of, of hitting the ground. And I think that's why God makes people grow up. <clears throat> In other words, so little, you know, when you're little like that, when you hit the ground, you don't have that far to go. And so he dusted, the father dusted off his son. And he gave him a hug. And he told him everything was fine. He wiped his tears. Then he patted him on the rear end there and he says, go and run some more. 
Run some more. I got you. In other words, son, I'm not going to abandon you. Son, I'm not going to stop loving you because you're learning how to walk. I'm not going to be disappointed with you because you're disappointed in yourself. You, you're still growing. And I want you all to understand and know that as a young Christian, as baby Christians, when you started out in Christ, you're learning how to behold all things and become new. You're learning about what your rights and privileges are in Christ, but you're still born again. You still are a new creation. You still are reconciled to God. Even if you've done some things that you know you should not have done. Even if you've done some things that it's like, this is crazy. Why am I doing this? I didn't come to Jesus and receive him as my Lord and Savior so that I can continue doing the things that I needed to be delivered from. That's right. So if you're disappointed, don't be disappointed in your heavenly father. And don't turn on yourself and start condemning yourself. The Holy Ghost is not condemning you, but your, your new nature is what's letting you know. If you're acting outside of the character of who you are in Christ, you've got an alert system on the inside of you that tells you. Now, that's, that doesn't go along well with who you are. <laughs> so you start having aware, an awareness that there's a voice on the inside of you. And the voice on the inside of you is your conscience. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit. Your conscience is the still small voice of your spirit. That means that when God talks to you, he's letting you know, <clears throat> you know, this is the way to walk in the right way. And God talks to you in your heart. Now, some people say, well, I had a conscience before I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You did. But if you weren't born again, then your conscience was not necessarily a safe guide because <clears throat> you were operating under a darkened heart and a darkened mind in a body that is subject to the laws of the world that's contaminated. So a non-believer can go out and do things that are wrong and not feel bad about the things they're doing. Uh, they may have an inkling, you know, I know it's bad, but hey, look, I'm doing bad because I guess they say it this way. There's just a dog in me. <laughs> Y'all ever heard that expression before? It's just a dog in me. Dog's got to be a dog. Well, a sinner is going to do what sinners do. But once you become a new creation in Christ Jesus, you're no longer a dog. Paul described it as I'm crucified unto the world and the world is crucified unto me. I'm no longer good for the devil. I'm no longer good for the world's system of doing things. I'm no longer comfortable with sin. If I go and do something wrong, something on the inside is bugging me. Something's scratching me down in here. Well, something's going on. I don't have a peace and a joy with doing wrong like I used to. I used to just be like a pig in slop. I mean, just get into it and that's all good. Ah, but not now. No longer sin is pleasurable. No longer is sin the way that I can live my life. There's something down on the inside of me just not right if I go out and do wrong. Ah, that's because you're a new creature. You're a new creation. If the butterfly attempts to live the same kind of lifestyle as the caterpillar, the butterfly is going to be frustrated because you're a new creature. So let's look at some scripture that describes how the new creature makes a difference in your life. Turn over to John's Gospel, chapter 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, I'll start reading in verse 1. Jesus was under the Old Testament period of, of the law, and he was explaining to a man that was wondering, Jesus, how are you doing all the things that you're doing? Je Jesus is going to explain unto him, I'm doing it by the ability of God, by the power of God, by the kingdom of God, by faith, by the anointing of God. But the man couldn't relate to it. Why? Because he's a caterpillar, and Jesus was not yet ascended up on high and not yet been crucified, but Jesus was walking in the power of the spirit of the anointing of God. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 1. 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, which means teacher. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus <clears throat> answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. Highlight or underline the words born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, when he said born again, he's talking about unless the man is born of the spirit of God, he'll not be able to relate with what the spirit of God makes possible to those that are born again. In other words, unless you are a butterfly, you ain't gonna, you're not going to understand how butterfly moves around in the air. You, you just, it's, you, if you were in the air as a caterpillar, you'd be thinking about how hard am I going to hit the ground? Your mind's not wired for flying. As a caterpillar, you, you can't relate with how even though gravity still exists, but yet gravity does not pull down the butterfly where the butterfly crashes to the ground. The butterfly is flying by rules of flight. But yet the butterfly is not afraid of hitting the ground. What I'm saying is, as a new creation person, make sure you understand that it's your responsibility now to act like what you genuinely are. You are born from above. Your spirit man has been changed. You now cannot eat leaves like you did when you were a butterfly. I mean a caterpillar. Now your job is to eat the honeysuckles and so forth. Here, Jesus is explaining the but to, to, uh, <laughs> to the butterfly. He's explaining to Nicodemus how important it is to be born again. Verse 3. John chapter three, verse three. And Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, which means faithfully or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit, capital S, which means born from the spirit of God. That which is born of the spirit of God is spirit, small s, which means the spirit of man. See, you're really a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your intellect, and you live inside of a physical body. So if a man is born again, that's because he's born from above. He's born from the Spirit of God. And as a new creation person, you are going to see the kingdom of God operate, whereas those that are not born again have, a, have no clue as to what's going on. And that's why you know in your heart, when something needs to be judged and you judge, even though you're a new creature, you may be just a day old, an hour old, five minutes old in Christ. But there are things you're going to know that you didn't know like you know now that you're a new believer in Christ Jesus. There are things you know now, you just know it. It's like, doesn't everybody know this? But you are speaking from a born again nature. You're born of the Spirit of God. So since your nature has changed, your capacity to judge has changed because you're born from God. Therefore, you understand God. You are reconciled to God and you are now having God to speak to you because he's not condemning you. He is communicating with you. So when you say, no, this is the way it ought to go. And people are looking at you saying, well, no, no. Well, how do you know that's right or wrong? It's like, but how is it that you don't know? They're a caterpillar still. They're not a butterfly. So there are things you know 
I'm going to explain this clearly from scripture because we're going to go into some scripture that talks about how that you know so well that now you can describe your desires and your yearnings and your expectations are so in line with God's will, but yet you find uh, uh, something going on in the world that displeases you. The stuff you used to do, you don't do anymore. You don't have a hunger and a desire to do those things from your heart anymore. So when you see people engaging in behavior that is destructive, that's violent, that is, that is definitely not of God, you start thinking, you start groaning. You start thinking, that's not good. No, that's, 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 that's not right. You know what? Even under the Old Testament, there were people that hung out with God, that communicated with God and started talking with God. And like Joseph in the Bible, Joseph in the Bible, he hung out with God, talked with God, fellowship with God, and God gave him dreams and vision. And Joseph was talking to God and so forth, even though he wasn't born again. So when Potiphar's wife said, hey, I want you in this compromising position. I want to lay down with you. He says, I cannot do that against God. I can't do that against your husband. And I'm not doing that against my own conscience. I'm not doing it. Well, she was so convinced that it was okay to do wrong that she made up a lie and had him arrested. But yet he's being arrested because he had a conscience. And what I'm saying to you all that are believers in Christ Jesus, the world looks at you and says, how do you think you're right? Are you more right than I am? Well, I'm just agreeing with God. Now, God is always right. So if you don't agree with God, that's your problem with God, not with me. But they're like, well, I can't see God, but I can certainly see you. So therefore, there are things you're going to have to deal with just because you know in your heart what is right. There are things you're going to have to deal with because others who are not children of obedience, but children of disobedience, which we can all understand because we came from the same place. We know what it's like to have been a caterpillar. But when you get turned on and get targeted as the object of, you know, I want to express aggression toward you and anger toward you and lie about you and try to put things on you that don't attribute aren't attributed to you. That's when you start having to say, well, who understands where I'm coming from? Oh, Jesus does. Because <laughs> Jesus was all the way right in pleasing the Father, and yet he got crucified. Now, you know, it's interesting that the, the, the court case that just got settled and so forth. And when I say got settled, judgment was made. The officer that did wrong was identified as being wrong or guilty. And people were like, yeah, you know, uh, that, that's right. Well, and that it made you so angry that you were willing to even go out and protest before, you know, when you thought anger, it was a reason to be justified in your anger. But how is it that you get angry over a man who had challenges? And yes, he was, he was not deserving of what happened to him. I agree completely and totally. So I, I'm totally in agreement with, yeah, the officer was wrong and guilty. He stepped outside of the bounds of his responsibility. But if you can have emotions about that, how come you can't have emotions about Jesus who was right and was killed? How is it that Jesus, innocent blood, doesn't bother you. How is it that he could say, I only do those things that please my father. And they're like, crucify him, crucify him. And there were people that were in court that said, I find no fault in this man. The soldiers that put, get, that put the, the, the spear through his side and that opened up his side so that water and blood gushed out said, this man wasn't guilty. There were others that said, he was not guilty. Now, how is it that you could be so cold and insensitive and nonchalant about that innocent man, Jesus, but yet you can get angry enough and frustrated enough to go out and do things about a man who had clearly some challenges? All I'm getting at is what would cause you to have a difference 
in your judging ability when it comes to Jesus. That's part of that old nature. That's all I'm saying. That old nature has enmity. The scriptures describe it as deep seated hatred against God. See, when you say, yeah, well, Jesus is not my issue. Well, he is your issue because God proved he was so right that God said death could not hold him. He was he came up out of the grave three days, and three nights after he was crucified. And now he is alive and well. And he is genuinely the Lord and Savior that every knee will bow and every tongue will have to confess that he is Lord and Savior. So if you wonder if you got to have to deal with Jesus, well, that's not the way I'm going to go and I'm not going to have that. I got another religion. Look, you can have any distractions you want. You can spill your time doing whatever you want to do. But the only thing is, you're going to have to come to this man. And God has made it clear, and he said it in Scripture, that he has chosen the day in which everybody will have to confess. So even if you don't want the benefit of being reconciled and made a butterfly, you're still going to tell the truth on your way to hell. Because hell is real. Because hell is the place that God has made for the devil and his angels and all them that agree with the devil and want to stick with the devil and want to do the devil's bidding and don't want to come to Christ, they are going to go to hell. Well, you're trying to scare me. I'm not scaring you. If I'm telling you the truth, just take the warning. Now look at the scripture here. We're looking at John chapter 3, correct? Verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That means don't let it trip you out. Don't you start acting like, well, I'm talking to you in such a way that you cannot understand when I'm going to explain it to you. Turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter one. Turn to Romans chapter one and you can read the rest of John chapter three on your own uh, as a homework assignment. But turn over to Romans chapter one. Now, Romans chapter one talks about us as believers. We're born again. Since we're born again, since we have the life of God on the inside of us, what say we live like we are learning about the new life? Amen. Look at Romans chapter one, verse one. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Underline that in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the by the resurrection uh, from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Circle and underline the word faith. The nature that you have now that you're a butterfly or a new creation, you have the nature of faith. That means on the inside of you is the capacity to believe God, to trust God, to honor God. You just, it's not, it's not difficult. It's not, a, it's not a confusing thing for you to be told, we believe God. You're like, right, I do. Why? Because you're a believer, not a non-believer. Okay, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my feet. No. No, God is my witness whom I serve with my feelings. No. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. Are y'all looking at the same scriptures I'm looking at? Notice that Paul says, I serve God with my spirit. I serve God with my spirit. That means that now that I am born again, now that I am alive unto God spiritually, my heart, my, the real me, can literally hear God. I can do what God's asking me to do. Why? 
Because even though he's invisible to the caterpillar, even though he's invisible to the non-believer, he's extremely more real to me. He's more real to me than even the physical body that I dwell in. He's more real to me than my wife. He's more real to me than my children. He's more real to me than the clothes I'm wearing. That is because I know him from my heart. Am I making any spiritual sense to you here? You're, you know him from your heart, and therefore you're told to serve him by listening to your heart. And when I say heart, I'm talking about your spirit, man. Paul said in verse 9 of Romans chapter 1, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Notice that Paul said, I'm going to continue talking about God because he is why I live. Looking now at some more scripture regarding this, turn to verse 14, Romans 1, verse 14. I am debtor, that means I'm obligated both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live, how? By faith. Now then, how is, the, how is the butterfly able to do what it's doing? It's able to do what it's doing because it operates by another law. And what I mean by that is, we as believers in Christ Jesus, we're told to operate by the law of faith. Yes, gravity still works, and the, and the world has to deal with gravity. But the butterfly operates by the laws of aeronautics. So we who are in Christ Jesus, we're told to operate by the law of faith, not be concerned or be brought down to a lifestyle that emulates the law of sin and death, which is in our flesh. Now, I've changed in my heart, but my body has not yet changed. So how then am I to please God? I have to please God from my heart. I cannot do it by my flesh. Now let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans the 7th chapter. Y'all getting some good information here? Paul is explaining what goes on when you become a new creature that, yeah, you got the same body you had before, but your attitude is different. Your nature is different. Your character cries out for godly things. Even if you're doing wrong, it's like, ah, I can't stay in this anymore. Whereas before you accepted Christ, you'd be like, hey, I can do what I want to do. My name is whatever. I'm big, bad, and bold. But then you come to Christ. It's like, you know what? I think I need to go ahead and consider what God has to say about this. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin, but by the law. For I have not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought or brought about in me all manner of concupiscence. Now concupiscence means I got all kind of lusty things going on with my body. He says, for without the law, for, with, uh, for without the law, sin was dead. Now, what do you mean without the law, sin was dead? That means if we had no knowledge of, the, of sin, then sin, the nature of sin, didn't act up. 
But once you became aware that sin exists and it has a law, it's kind of like I go scuba diving, my wife and I, we scuba dive and so forth. And what if we have a diving instructor, instructor and the diving instructor has us all big magnifying glasses and we're down below in the sea bottom. And then he says, all right, look, stop, everybody stop, float right here and look through your magnifying glass. And we don't see anything because we're just looking at the sand. But now we can see through the magnifying glass some outlines of stingrays. And sure enough, as we see the outline of stingrays, the stingrays are made aware. Oh, we've been spotted. They're not floating past us. And then the stingrays, knowing that they've been spotted, began to take flight in the water. You understand. They just flap in the water and they take off. But if we were not given an instrument to be able to identify that they're there, we could have floated right over them and not even known it. So the Bible says here, when God gave you the Ten Commandments, you now have a magnifying glass to see the nature of sin. And sin was just hanging out in your flesh. Sin was just hanging out in your spirit, which was against God. Sin was just hanging out in your mind, which is not filled with the knowledge of God. But then you get the knowledge of the Ten Commandments, and it's like, thou shalt not, thou shalt, you shall do this, but thou shalt not do this. It's like... What's going on? I had not known lust unless I was told not to lust. I didn't, I, I didn't really lie before until I was told, don't lie. Now that I'm told, don't lie. I find myself lying and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? What's happening? You got a magnifying glass to see sin. So the Ten Commandments were never given to you to make you born again. The Ten Commandments was given to you to help you see that the law of sin it, re it is real. You can literally identify sin. Sin is from the devil and sin has repercussions and you don't have to wonder how do I describe it. You can easily describe it because sin is a transgression of the law. Now Paul the Apostle goes on to explain it. He says verse 8. Romans chapter 7, verse 8. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And what Paul is saying is that when I was a little boy, I was innocent. I was just running around doing whatever I'm doing. I didn't really know. But then when the commandment came to me, thou shalt not, I started doing the things that I should not do. I was made aware, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? Sin kicked up and he began to work against the law of God and sin revived and he died. He became identified as a spiritually dead man, dead little boy, meaning at the age of accountability, he's disobedient to God's known will. Now, verse 10. For the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful or exposed for what it was. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. The Ten Commandments came from God, and we know God is spiritual. But I am carnal, that means fleshly, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. No, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law 
that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's your spirit. But I see another law. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, you can call it, you can call it gravity, for example. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ, being born again, the law of faith, makes you where you can live above the dictates of the flesh. See, this is classroom. You're learning how to take flight. You're learning how to act like a butterfly. You're learning how not to crawl on the ground like a caterpillar. Because that'd be weird for butterflies to just start crawling around on the ground. Are you with me? So now that you're a new creation, how do you describe the, 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 the differences of your spirit versus your flesh? Your spirit man, your spirit man is alive unto God and wants to do what God wants. But your flesh doesn't. So don't ever turn your back on your flesh. Did you get that? Don't ever turn your back on your flesh. And then in your heart, you know you've grown. You've grown because how do I get delivered from this body? The answer is one day Jesus is coming and our bodies will be changed to reflect what happened in our heart. Did y'all get this? Why do we come together and hear the word of God? Because the word of God is food for our spirit. Let's partake of communion. We have determined to behold all things have become new. We're looking at things now and we're looking at all of life and we're looking at everything for the spiritual man judges all things. You have a responsibility to judge all things and judge yourself and judge what you're doing. If what you're doing doesn't please God, then say, no, I'm not going to walk in the flesh that has a will contrary to what God's will is. But I'm going to walk in the spirit and allow God's word to be that which I follow, not the feelings that make me contrary to the will of God. So you're growing up spiritually. As newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And you're going to see all kind of wonderful things that you'll be able to do. The fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit. We're going to talk about all kind of things. And after a while, you'll be like, boy, I sure have grown. I'm flying. You're supposed to be. (laughs) That's what you were born again to do. And when I say that, you all understand the analogies that I'm using. So let's hold our elements in our hands. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. The cup represents the blood that was shed for us. We're renewing our mind in the word of God. And remember, God's not angry with you because you're learning. God's not mad at you because you may have done some horrendous things. You'd be like, how did I do that? I was naming Jesus. Yeah, but you didn't know how to describe and how to walk and serve from your spirit. Now you're learning. Now you're growing. And so we're sitting, sitting together at the table of the Lord. So the bread represents the body as I pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you that the bread represents the body of our Lord and Savior that was broken for us. Proving and showing that truly he died on our behalf. And then you raised him from the dead on the third day. And he died because he took our death. He suffered because he took our suffering so that we could have 
your life. So Jesus, we don't take it lightly. We remember your death and we remember your resurrection. In Jesus' name, Father, thank you for the bread that we partake of. We'll live accordingly. Let's eat together. Hallelujah. Let's live our lives as new creation people. All over the world, everybody who believes on Jesus, new creation people, learning, should be learning, how to walk and how to fly in Christ. Now then, the cup represents the blood that was shed for us because it established the new covenant. We are God's very own covenant people. That means that we're in personal relationship with God by faith in love with him and him for us. My wife and I, we're, we're, we're human beings, man and woman. We, we're able to respect each other. We're citizens and everything of this, of this nation and of, uh, we, we can motivate and driver's licenses and all kinds of things together. But I have a different relationship with her than I do with other people. Meaning that my wife and I, we're in a covenant. We're married, a blood covenant. And we're able to do things that people outside the covenant are not able to do, you understand? So here we are as Christians. We have a relationship with God. We have a covenant with God and God loves you and he wants you to have his best. That's his desire for us always. And we want his best to manifest in our lives. So Father God, we thank you and praise you for giving us Jesus and giving us the, the wonderful promises, the exceeding great and precious promises in Christ Jesus that are to us, yes, and to us, amen, that means so be it. We'll live the covenant life. We'll live and enjoy our fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink. We're new creation people. We're new creatures. How is it that we can come hear the word of God and it makes a difference in our life? I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth now, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.